All right, here we go. We're talking tonight about how to handle temptation. This is uh, lesson nine in our foundation series, how to handle temptation. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13 here, it says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful, and He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, He will show you a way out so you can endure. There's some things I want you to know about temptation tonight, and we want you to, to be an overcomer. And you can do that. But some things you need to understand first is that there's temptation all around. It's all around, and you're going to be tempted. But understand that temptation is not sin. Let me say that again because I, I want everybody to get this and to know this. Temptation is not sin. Being tempted doesn't mean you're sinning. And there are a lot of young Christians who, who feel guilty over being tempted. And that's just another deceptive trick of Satan. That he, he brings temptation into your life, wanting you to, to be tripped up. But even when you stand strong by it and not give in to the temptation, he tries to bring about a guilt upon you for even being tempted. But I'm telling you, you can overcome temptation, and temptation is not sin. You have to handle it the right way. And in handling temptation the right way, what you'll find is that you'll become even closer to God. And that's what all of us want to see happen in your life. So here's three ways to handle temptation. The first is this, you can give in to it. Now, I don't suggest that. In fact, I suggest don't. Don't give in to it. But when you give in to it, you have, you have fallen down onto the same plane or same level as the animals. Why would I say that? Animals live for themselves. Self-preservation, self-gratification. It's about all just about their needs or their wants Whereas you and I, we can live on a higher, higher level than that. We can live above that. You could give in to it, but don't. I suggest choose, you know, choose to fight it. Now, a lot of people try to fight it and do it out of their own strength. Or they try to do it in their own flesh. Trying to stay strong by their own willpower. You can't just will yourself to be an overcomer. And because some, some try that, they, they find themselves at some times getting weak or weary. They typically will find themselves constantly struggling in their faith because they're trying to do it under their own power. But they have to keep fighting and battling and they become weak. But the third way is you overcome it through Christ. Overcoming through Christ. See, He wants you to live victoriously, and He will strengthen and empower you to, to do just that. You don't have to be a slave to this world, that, that, the, that the devil and your flesh do not have to conquer you, but through the, through the power of Christ, you can overcome that. God is faithful. We read that scripture that He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able that He will always make a way of escape for you. So let me encourage you to take it. Take that way out. All right, let's keep going. Let me talk about the subjects of temptation. The subjects. I hope you've downloaded your, your, your handout for this, for this study guide here. Fill in the blanks as we go along. The subjects of temptation. See, we're all subjects of temptation. We'll all be tempted. Being, being saved does not make you immune to temptation. It doesn't exempt you from it. Jesus Christ Himself, while He was on a fast, Satan realizing that He would be weak in His own flesh, came to Jesus to tempt Him. And now we know Jesus was perfect and without sin, but Jesus was tempted. There, there are temptations that we will face. Dishonesty, materialism, sex, greed, Pride. Those, those are all different temptations. But temptation isn't a sin, and nobody is immune. Hebrews 4.15 says, This high priest of ours, meaning Jesus, he understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, 
yet he did not sin. But if you're careless in how you deal with temptation, you'll find yourself falling into sin. It, dealing with temptation is a serious matter. And if you don't deal with it, it's going to deal with you. Maybe the greatest danger is when a person tries to just fight the temptation on their own, having so much confidence in themselves that they fail to trust God. And when you do that, you're bound to fail. A question I get asked often is, why doesn't God remove all temptation? Here's a fill in the blank for you. Because God's plan is not immunity, but victory. God's plan isn't immunity, but it's victory so that you may triumph in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're subject to temptation, and in doing so, we learn to depend upon Jesus. What's the source of temptation? According to 1 John 2.15, it tells us, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. So one of the places temptation comes from is from the world. But another is from our flesh, and another is from the devil. And the world, the flesh, and the devil. You know, in, in fact, those three things are called the unholy trinity, or the unholy trinity of temptation. The world, the flesh, and the devil. And we're going to jump into those a little deeper. But temptation is not unique. Your temptation is not unique. We are all basically tempted in the same ways. Let's talk about the world. The world, that's, that's the eternal foe. It's not referring to planet Earth or to the people of the world. We, we all know John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God's talking about a system. In the, in the Greek, it, it's the cosmos, meaning, meaning an order, a, a system. But that the world's system is contrary to the Lord and to, to His ways. So we're not to be conformed to this world. Romans 12 and 2 tells us, Do not copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's, God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And then James 4 and 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. So that's the world. Then there's the, the flesh, and that's the, it's the internal foe, the flesh. Galatians 5, beginning at verse 19. When you, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other, sin like, other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the flesh, in the Bible, it's not talking about our physical bodies because the physical body isn't evil. In 1 Corinthians 6, in verse 19, it says, And don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So our body's not evil. It's, it's to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. It ought to be something holy. But, but the flesh means we have a, a predisposition to sin. Fill that in in your blanks there. Flesh means we have a predisposition to sin. Flesh is the old nature. It, it's what we have. We've inherited this from Adam. All because of the sin and the fall of the garden, now we all have this same predisposition to sin. And the enemy knows that, and he will come, and he will fight, and he will do everything he can to try to bring you down. The flesh doesn't need the, the devil in order to sin. The flesh will actually sin on its own if you allow it. Ephesians 2 and verse 3 says, All of us used to live that way 
following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. And then there's that third one in the unholy trinity, the devil. That's the in, infernal foe. Infernal foe. That, this means that Satan is the mastermind behind all these things. Ephesians 6.12, For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So it's Satan, Lucifer, the devil. He is our enemy. He plans to try to sabotage your life. He plans to try to bring death to happiness, to kill and steal your, your joy and your victory, your life, and bring about an impurity and ungodliness into your life. And He'll do that if you allow Him to. So what is the seat of temptation? 1 Thessalonians 5.23 tells us, Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until the Lord Jesus Christ comes again. See, temptation can only happen in the body or the soul or the spirit. God is a triune God. There's God the Father, Jesus His Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. We, we were made and created in the Im image of our Father, so we have this triune nature ab about us, body, soul, and spirit, a, a triunity nature, just as Almighty God Himself is. So the first seat of temptation is the body to be tempted in your earthly body. In, eh, probably the most obvious and pretty easy to, to see when you're being tempted there. But another seat of temptation is, is the soul. And your soul is inside your body. The Greek word for soul is suchi. It's where we get our word psychic, psychology, Psychiatry, your, your soul is the, it's the psychological part of you. It's your mind, your emotions, your, your will. It's what makes you, you. It's your sense of humor, your intellect, your, your tastes, your idiosyncrasies. Your soul is also known as your, your ego or self. Now, the third seat of temptation is the spirit. Hebrews 4.12, For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It's telling us here that soul and spirit are two different and distinct things. They're very much alike in many, in many ways. Both are invisible. Soul are, and spirit are invisible indivisible except for when God does that work, but they're not identical. They're not the same thing. The spirit inside of a man or woman is, is, is different in him than all other creatures. Man has a spirit because we were made in the image of God. John 4, 24, for God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. Romans 8, 16, for His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. Adrian Rogers, late pastor, great man of God, he, he said in his book, What Every Christian Ought to Know, he said this, quote, The spirit in your nature can know, have, and commune with God. It's your spirit in your nature can, can know, have, and commune with God. We can fellowship we, right with God Almighty. So let's try to go a little deeper and understand that about the body, the soul, and the spirit. You see, with my physical body, I, I have life. I have physical life. And in doing so, I, 
I know the world that is beneath me, that I walk around on, that I live in daily. With, with my soul, I have psychological. And, and through that, I'm allowed to know the world that is around me and within me. With my spirit, I have, I have spiritual life. And with that, I can know the world that is above me. The plants don't have a, a soul or spirit. Animals have a body and a soul or consciousness, but no spirit. Human beings have a body, soul, and spirit. We, we are the ones who commune with God. We can talk to and with God, and we can also hear and receive from God that He communes with us. We can have intimate fellowship, a connection with God because we've been redeemed by Jesus Christ. A whole person is healthy in body, mind, soul, spirit. See, the world looks to attack the soul. The world primarily attacks the soul. And a, a worldly Christian is a person whose mind and emotion and will They've been, they've been squeezed into this ungodly, ungodly mold. And the, and the world will try to shape you into something that God never intended you to be. A biblical example of this is, is Lot, Abraham's nephew. You go way back into, into Genesis. Abraham and Lot, have, they've amassed a great deal of, of wealth and all of these animals and there's conflict between their all of their servants in trying to find water and grazing lands for all these herds and so lot and abraham say you know we'll separate and abraham says lot you choose you go this way i'll go that way you want to go that way i'll go this way take your choice nephew and it and it tells us in the bible that that lot chose to to well, he pitched his tents towards Sodom, that they were the well-watered plains of Sodom. He, he knew what kind of place Sodom was. Initially, he didn't go into Sodom because it was such a vile city. But later, he and his family end up living in Sodom. He, he didn't need to put himself through that. He, he shouldn't have been in that situation. He, he was already wealthy. But he chose the, the thought of amassing more wealth and taking, taking my family down near Sodom. I won't go in, but the area around it looks so inviting. And so he went, and the world was attacking his soul, and it lured him into that sinful place, and it brought about a great deal of destruction. The flesh, it attacks the body. Our, our carnal desires will attack our, our bodies. The, the, the sins of the flesh cause so much pain and agony against our bodies. It's primarily against the, the body. And I think, about, I think about people I know and even relatives that I've had that that wrestled with drugs and alcohol and they they abused their their bodies and the destruction and the devastation that it that it brought to them but it's not just drugs and alcohol it's sins of gluttony and the violence laziness uh, perversion all examples king david his sin came from his, that fleshly appetite. You see, he should have never been in the palace when he was tempted by Bathsheba, when he was tempted to sin, and he, of course, committed adultery and then had to try to commit, he did commit a mur murder of her husband in order to try to cover it up, but it was his flesh that drove him, but he should have never been there. He should have been, as king, he should have been with his, with his army. 
but the flesh was drawing him and he gave in to the earthly desires of the flesh. And man, it was destructive. It's the devil that attacks the spirit. The devil primarily wages war against your spirit. So why? Your spirit is part of your nature that enables you to know and to worship God. And his desire is to drive a wedge between you and God. The, the devil wants for you to be a, a self-confident man or woman and, and to trust in your own abilities and to try to handle everything yourself. He wants you to be a, a, a person who has no dependency upon God. And he'll encourage you to handle it yourself and be strong. And in doing so, he's driving a wedge between you and the Lord. Satan worked on Peter's faith and it, on his relationship with God. Jesus told him in Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me, turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. He'll do the same thing. He'll do the same thing for you. God loves you. He knows Satan is going to come and tempt you to come against your life and your soul. And should you fail, He is there and He loves you and He will restore you. He's already paid the price to redeem you. But He encourages us. We're encouraged in the Word. When those things come, when the attacks or when the temptations come, Ephesians 6.16 talks about the full armor of God putting that on, but in 16, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. You can overcome temptation. Be strong in your faith. Be obedient to the Word. We're getting close to finishing. But let me talk about the seasons of temptations. Seasons. There's three seasons as I see it. Youth, middle age, and old age. In youth, temptations are prim primarily in the realm of the body. It's sin against the body. Sex, drugs, violence, laziness. Let's call them the sins of youth. In middle age, temptation primarily comes in the realm of the soul the ego, wanting the bigger and the better material things, wanting the, the achievements, the fame, the accolades, the, the praise of other people. We want people to stroke our ego. And Satan comes to tempt us in that. And the third season is that of old age. And with older people, the devil attacks in the realm of their spirit, causing them to, to have doubts and fears. Fearing Sickness, fearing cancer, fearing losing their loved ones, fearing whether or not the, the money for retirement is going to hold out for the rest of their life. So the devil attacks in the realm of the spirit. Temptation can come at any age, but there does seem to be seasons where there certain things are stronger than at other times. And finally, our last section is talking about subduing temptations. See, by understanding how the devil works, then it's much easier to get victory over him. And we need to get victory against the world. And the key to do the, doing that is, is our faith in Jesus. You overcome by your faith. In 1 John 5, 4, it says, For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. You conquer this world and the temptations of this world through your faith. Why is that? Because as Christians, we see Jesus with the, with the eye of faith. And then we find our satisfaction in, in Christ. And in 1 John 2.15, it says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. See, Remember this, you're never too old to never, excuse me, you're never told to fight this to fight this world and the 
sins and temptations of this world, you're never told to fight that without Jesus. Because if you do and you try, you're a worldly Christian. You're going to fail. You can't do it on your own, by your own strength or power. We have to exhibit and have faith in Jesus. And when we do, we'll have victory. 1 John 5, 5, And who can win this battle against the world? Get this, only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's the only, only ones that will get this victory over this world, is those that believe Jesus is the Son of God. And in subduing temptations, we need to subdue those against the flesh. And the key to doing that is, is, is flight or get out. 2 Timothy 2.22, I love this verse. Run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. There's such wisdom there. Flee. Get away from those youthful lusts, but the, the wisdom of, of finding companionship, friendships, relationships with, with other people who call on the Lord who also want to live a righteous life. You build a support system. And that means so much in your success, in your growth in Christ. 1 Corinthians 6.18, Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. 1 Corinthians 10.13, the, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. And He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. It, your temptations are no different than than what I experience, what others experience, what your, what your parents and grandparents and great, 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 great grandparents. It's no different. You have to take it serious. Don't flirt with temptation. Don't play around with it. Remove the objects in your life that seem to be causing the temptation because if you, if you play around with it or tolerate it or it can have a devastating effect in your life. You just can't reason with sins of the flesh. And then the last one is against the devil. And overcoming that, the key is, is fight. In Ephesians 6, 12, putting on the full armor of God, fight that good fight of faith. In James 4, 7, so humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James says, resist the devil. You do that by the blood of Jesus. Revelations 12, 11 tells us that we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Resist him. He'll flee from you. How do you, how do you resist the devil? And I close with this. First, you make sure that there's no sin, no unconfessed or unrepented sin in your life. You can't be living and walking around in, in sin, actively engaging in sin, and then saying, Oh, God, help me to, to not give in to sin. Confess your sin. Make sure that there's no sin. Repent. When you do, God is faithful and just, and He will forgive you of your sins. He'll cleanse your life. And the second thing you do is you claim deliverance through the cross. God, I'm thankful that you have saved me, you redeemed me, you washed me with your blood, you have cleansed my life, and you've changed my, my destiny, my, my faith and my hope, my trust is in you, and, and Father, I, I cry out to you for help, for strength. I, I ask you, Lord, to, to do your work in my life, to that I will overcome and I'll conquer the, the temptation, that I'll not fall into sin. And that, Father, my life would become an example of 
not only someone saved by grace, but someone that's been del delivered and set free. Claim your deliverance to the cross through what Jesus Christ did for you. You overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross of Calvary and by the word of your testimony. So proclaim it. Share it. If you're struggling with something, find a trusted, a trusted ally, confident, confidant that you can, you can share with, that you can pray one for another there. Lift each other up. At the bottom of your handout, there's some review questions for you. I hope you'll go through those. And I hope that you'll continue to, to seek God, continue to be an overcomer. We love you here at New Life Church. Keep growing in the Lord. God bless you.